Hi, welcome to Christchurch Chorleywood. I'm David Hall, the vicar here. I'm just doing a little video uh, film, uh, just replacing my vicar's letter. A little bit shorter, quicker, snappier, and hopefully even more interesting. A um, couple of things I just want to mention to you. Uh, first of all, a massive thank you to all those who've given to our technology fund that we started. It's been brilliant. We've raised well over the £20,000 that we needed to put in the video and technology we need for our ongoing online transmission. So massive thank you. We're closing that fund now. Please keep giving though because we're doing loads of things in ministry and helping people now uh, through God's grace all over the world. So uh, we're closing that fund and we're kind of kind of asking you to carry on giving to the general fund now but thank you all of you and this Sunday is the second of two Sundays last of two Sundays where actually as our special focus of our giving we're giving to the Beirut uh, uh, appeal and we're giving through tier fund uh, to help those affected by the recent tragedy in Beirut so do please give generously to that uh, through your main collection giving today we really want to help the people there in a big way um, I've got some happy news uh, sad happy news though uh, and that is that Jacob will be leaving us as curates unfortunately have to um, to uh, become assistant chaplain at Cranley School and uh, we will really miss uh, Jacob and Zippy um, but we are thanking God for them and obviously this 
is a wonderful opportunity for them. Uh, his last duties with us will be at the end of November. So we've got a little bit of time uh, to, to say our goodbyes and so forth. But obviously we wish them the best. Do pray for them at this time of transition as we give thanks and as we look forward to what God will do through them next. Um, my only last thing I want to mention is that next week, uh, 4th of uh, um, October, is our harvest weekend. And uh, we're going to be juggling. The weather's likely to be colder, so we may well be juggling around our configuration of services. But we'll definitely have a harvest theme. And we will be posting stuff on our, on our website and out through um, all our connections uh, just to alert you to the arrangements. But stand by for changes to our service arrangements as the weather closes in. And whatever it, we do, it'll be an amazing celebration of God's goodness. Do join us uh, on the 4th of uh, October at our harvest services. God bless you. Well, good morning, Christchurch. I hope you're doing amazing. Um, it's so thrilled that you could join us uh, online this morning and, uh, and tune in and worship with us and uh, hear from God's word, which we'll be hearing from later from David. Um, but just a couple of quick, uh, a quick announcement to make for you. Um, if you're in years 10 to, uh, to, to 13, I say 10 to 14, that's not a year. If you're in years 10 to 13, YPF is back. Uh, we've been meeting every Wednesday in the church, um, socially distanced, we have to wear masks, um, and we'll be doing, we're doing a youth service every Wednesday night. But the, the exciting notice is, is that from, next, uh, from this Wednesday coming, uh, we're going to be beginning the Youth Alpha, and uh, it's going to be really special. But instead of me talking about it, um, why don't you just watch the following? Okay, you rolling? Okay, we're going to scare Jason with this spider. Come on, we're going to get him back. Watch it! Guys, this is a film set. You got it. Tons of things happen in our lives every day. And in a 24 hour period, we ask ourselves so many different questions. Like, what should I eat? What should I wear? Or who should I hang out with? Sometimes we ask bigger questions like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Who will I marry? Or where will I live? But every once in a while, we ask ourselves those even bigger questions. Questions like, why am I here? What's my purpose? And is there more to life than this? The reality is, there aren't a lot of places we can go to explore life's biggest questions. So on Alpha, we want to create a space where we can talk about those kind of questions in a way that's open and honest. In each one of our hearts, it's like we have a happiness bucket that we're constantly trying to fill. It can sound like this. If I just had uh, more money or nicer clothes or a new girlfriend, then I'd be happy. The nights would come and the girls would be gone. Like, they'd be just me, you know, me and I guess God, right? And I'm like, okay, there's definitely more to life than this. Like, I just want, I want, I want, I want, and you don't get anything. There's this deeper, even spiritual hunger that we're all trying to satisfy. As someone who grew up in an atheistic home, I wasn't just going to accept what he was going to say. So I was like, okay, did this actually happen historically? What's the evidence? I'm not going to just buy into something because I get swept up in the emotion of it. You have approximately 570,000 hours left to live. And we want to invite you to spend less than 24 of them with us on Alpha. Isn't that amazing? So I really want to encourage you, uh, if you're in year uh, 10 to 13 and you're not connected with the YPF, firstly, connect with us. Uh, you can send me an email. Um, my details are on the church website. Um, perhaps you're a parent and uh, you'd love your, your child to come along. That would be amazing. Also, if you're in YPF, Youth Alpha might be a really great way uh, to introduce your friends to Jesus. So why not um, invite your friends, bring them along. Um, I know it's going to be a really special time. And uh, with that... Uh, now to Anne, who's going to lead us into our time of confession. Let's have a moment or two in silence as we remember before God ways in which we fail to keep his commandments. Words from Psalm 51 and verses 1 to 2. Together. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions. Wash away our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Amen. Words of assurance from Psalm 103, 
verses 11 to 13. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who revere him. Amen. And now we praise God together. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Amen.
Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can pray to you at all. Thank you for this amazing privilege to talk to the creator of the universe. And we acknowledge that this is not because we are anything special, but it is because of your son's death on the cross. Father, we thank you for what Jesus has done by removing that separation between us and God so that we can talk to you and know that you hear us and accept us because of him. We thank you for the Holy Spirit interceding for us when we don't know what to say and presenting our requests as what we should pray before you. And Father, thank you that we can ask for things. And so we do, we bring people on our hearts and situations on our hearts to you. Firstly, I just want to pray uh, for that, for the whole nation in our time uh, of this virus, that you will continue to give those in leadership wisdom and us as individuals wisdom as well and how, how, to, how to act and what to do. May we not be consumed by fear. May we not be consumed by anxiety or worry, but still remember to have our trust and our hope rooted and fixed in you. But please also help us to love our neighbours in, in the way we are acting as well. I pray for the church that we, we do not slumber through this time, but we are receptive and open to you. May we grow how you want us to, as you have shaken us. May we be awake and fully alert and receptive to your voice at this time. Yeah, we, we do pray for those making decisions in the leadership of our country, that they would honour you in how they do that and that they would make wise decisions. We pray for our church leaders, please, from, from those in all denominations who just want to honour you and glorify you, please help them to make decisions based on your will. We pray for our own leadership here at church, especially David Hall. And we thank you for all the, uh, the wisdom and guidance you've worked through him through the past years, but also especially at the moment. Please continue to support him, fill him with your peace and give him joy in your spirit as he leads us as, as, as your church here. Father, praying for our, our mission partners around the world, and we particularly pray, uh, I want to pray for Teresa, Teresa Wilson, and I thank you that you're enabling her to continue working on the translation. I pray for that whole team of SIL and, and Wycliffe working in Papua New Guinea. You continue uh, to help them to translate the word and it would reach and impact the souls of those there for eternity. pray for the schools as well and we pray God that you somehow as there is confusion and anxiety around the staff and often the children as well that your peace uh, would, would, would be pervasive there that, that even children would turn and see that they need a hope in you and finally, we pray for ourselves and the people we know who are ill or who are struggling with various different uh, trials and, and, and all, sorts of, all sorts of life's issues, whether it be grief or sickness or mental illness or other things. We pray for just in the silence now for the people on our hearts. Thank you that you hear us, Lord. Please help us to grow closer to you, to walk closer with you, to hear what you're saying through your spirit and your word, and to live lives which honour you and are fixed, are rooted in your eternal hope. I pray these things for your sake and that you may be glorified as well. We love you, Lord. We want to know you more. And I pray for the rest of this service, we can encounter you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.
We conclude our time of prayer by saying together the prayer that our Saviour Jesus taught us to pray. Together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 16. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for you your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets before you, before you who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under other people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, let's, let's pray. Oh, loving Lord, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity of looking at uh, an incredibly important piece of scripture for ourselves. Please guide us, please help us, and please help us to see the words that you have written and to understand their meaning for our lives. This we ask for your dear name's sake. Amen. Amen. Well, we're looking together at uh, Matthew uh, 5, verses 1 to 16. Matthew 5, verses 1 to 16, commonly called the Beatitudes. We're looking at the most famous sermon from the most famous person written in the most famous book in the whole universe. Um, uh, No pressure. And you know, there's an irony about this uh, sermon and this passage. Um, I think it is a passage that I didn't think I needed. It talks about being meek and merciful and a peacemaker. And I thought, I'm already doing that. Um, I'm not just a personal Christian. I am a professional Christian. I'm meek and mild and merciful for a living. Um, Or so I thought until Thursday morning this week. I was driving Daniel to the gym early in the morning, and maybe I was a little bit on edge. Um, when, when Daniel runs, he, he doesn't run to the gym, he runs at the gym. Uh, so like a kind of elderly Queen Victoria, he needs to be driven everywhere. And we were driving down Berry Lane, and I saw this lorry in the distance. Um, there were a couple of cars, blocking, cars sort of blocking his progress uh, in his lane on the right, Um, on his side of the road, there was tons of space for him to pull over. And I could see that he could see me, but he kept coming. And it was my priority, so I kept coming. Now he was in a massive lorry and I was in my Nissan Micra. My Nissan Micra is the smallest car on the road in this part of England, but we've we've bonded, we've bonded. In mileage terms, we've traveled three quarters of the distance to the moon, and one day we hope to land there together. Uh, The trouble with small cars is that they can be insecure, and insecurity can lead to aggression. Notice I'm already blaming the car. Anyway, 
both the car and the lorry stopped with the road blocked. And I went, and the lorry driver went. And after a short pause, I reversed, and with a sarcastic smile, I waved him through. Whereupon Daniel asked, do you ever drive aggressively, Father? No, I do not drive aggressively, I answered. The next day, I approached the same bend, this time from the opposite direction, just like the lorry driver the day before. And unlike the lorry driver, I pulled over to let a car pass. But that car wanted to turn across me into the parade of shops. And so he paused again. I reversed. I let him through. Not a smile, not a wave, not a look. Don't ask me to bury your dead. Only joking. Blessed are the peacemakers. I need the Sermon on the Mount. The lorry driver needs the Sermon on the Mount. The whole world needs the Sermon on the Mount. Even my Nissan Micra needs the Sermon sermon on the Mount. Now, much more seriously, what if that lorry driver has a meeting to attend with his boss that afternoon, which he's anxious about? He knows his firm needs to lose, 30% of its drivers, and he's running late for a delivery to the company's top client due to unexpected traffic on the M25 that morning, and he knows he has to get there, but I don't know that. What about the ungrateful car driver who turned across and uh, ignored me? What if he ignored me because he's focusing on turning in to get to the chemist as soon as possible? His wife has run out of painkillers late last night and he needs to get back to her with more. But I don't know that. We live in a world where we know some of other people's sins but little of their sorrows. And if I were to try and sum up the Beatitudes in one word, they would be the word compassion. Compassion. Receive the compassion of God fully and completely for yourself and display the compassion of God fully and completely to others. Why might it be important to display God's compassion? Well, compassion is the essential characteristic of God. If God had been holy without being compassionate, he would have abandoned the world. If he'd been powerful without being compassionate, he would have destroyed the world. Compassion is the active love of God right here, right now, to change us and to change the world that he has made. And when we display his compassion, we give hope to others. In a way, the Beatitudes are a completion of the Ten Commandments. They're an overview of what people have done uh, to completely follow Christ. Um, They're all uh, in one sermon And I'm going to unpack that passage now. But before we do, I want to just check on our definition here. What does blessed mean? Well, it appears here nine times. uh, And it's very hard to define. And the definition that I'm most happy with is this. Uh, In this context, blessed means approved by God now, rewarded by God in eternity, and filled with his peace. And an easy way to remember what blessed means, if you take the first uh, letters of each of those words, F, filled, A, approved, R, rewarded, far. And if you do these things that God says we should do in this passage, spiritually speaking, you will go far. Right, I'm going to deal first uh, with the first four uh, of the uh, kind of precepts laid out here under the title, Compassion Received. God's compassion is received when in the power of the Holy Spirit, God meets us in our need and fills us with his power. Um, Governments all over the world are trying to care for their people in this pandemic. Our own governments made mistakes, um, and every government, I think, has made mistakes. They don't always get it right, do they? Uh, The Times on Friday carried a report from the Greek spiritual retreat of Mount Athos. It said this, a hermit in the cave, in a cave at the southern tip of the peninsula, has been ordered to self-isolate. That is the last thing he needs. He needs to get out more. But the compassion of Christ, more seriously, perfectly meets 
our needs. And it seems he is interested in surprising people who might possibly have taken themselves off out of circulation a bit. Uh, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who are the poor in spirit? Well, there are two Greek words for poor. There's one uh, that refers to what I, I, I think a previous Prime Minister, Theresa May, would have called the just coping, the just coping. Uh, the Greek word used here, though, is much stronger. It, it means destitute. It's linked to the verb uh, for crouching and, and cowering. So verse 3 says, there's a kingdom of God, and that suggests a, a royal prerogative, um, and the power belongs to them. So it's quite an interesting contrast, isn't it? So what this is saying is basically, if you are helpless and you have nothing, God in Christ plans to give you everything. That really is compassion, isn't it? Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Greek, word, the Greek word used for mourning here is the most uh, intense word available um, uh, in the language of the time. Uh, it means intense uh, lament. Um, it could refer to the loss of a loved one or mourning over sin and the suffering of this world. Um, mourning really is suffering, isn't it? As a human being, we, we try to avoid it, don't we? But as spiritual beings, we need it. Mourning the loss of a loved one causes us to realize our own mortality and look deep within ourselves. Um, this old poem by uh, Robert Browning is quite helpful. He said, I, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learnt from her when sorrow walked with me. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's compassion, isn't it? Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The American industrialist John Paul Getty, at one point uh, described as the richest private citizen on earth, uh, mocked this verse by extending it to, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, but not its mineral rights. He thought the meekness in this verse meant letting people walk all over you. But again, the word used here in the original means humility and self-control. Two things which John Paul Getty did not have. And we are not so much to be a doormat as a doorway through which others catch a glimpse of the character of Christ. How many things have we said and done that we have later come to regret? A lack of self-control uh, was the ruination of the ancient world. In a drunken fit of temper, Alexander the Great hurled a spear at his best friend and killed him. He ruled an empire, but he could not rule himself. But those who under God have humility and have self-control will inherit the earth. They won't have to take it. Inheritance is given through the death of the giver. And when Christ returns, those who have been displaying his humility and his self-control will be the inheritors of his kingdom. The fourth uh, beatitude under uh, that theme of receiving compassion is uh, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This verse has always stayed with me. One summer, uh, when I was 15 years old, I was traveling back by train right across the country from the Welsh coast to the Norfolk coast, near where my parents lived. And it was after uh, a covenant a Christian camp at Crickieth. I'd been massively encouraged spiritually and as I thought about the year ahead and I kind of in my heart had a new resolution to seek the presence of God and to obey him, um, the train kind of pulled into Crew Station and this verse was on board um, uh, the, the, the side of the station platform. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied. It's self-explanatory, isn't it? If we think of all the physical appetites that we have and how we satisfy them, if we put even a quarter of that into our relationship with God, how different things would be. Now for compassion outpoured. 
From the remaining Beatitudes, uh, we see they're kind of less more about receiving the uh, character of Christ, more about displaying it in an active way uh, for the blessing of others. One morning in uh, 1898, the whole of Bristol ground to a halt. Tens of thousands of people left their workshops, their offices, their humble kitchens, their elegant houses, whatever, and stood reverently by the side of the road, bringing the whole city to a stop. In the orphan house, a thousand children gathered for a special service. Who were they mourning? Well, when the funeral procession came into view, it was a very simple one. The man being mourned was George Muller. He'd been rescued from a life of crime when he came to Christ, um, attending a, a prayer meeting, a church prayer meeting. He went on to establish 117 schools, giving a Christian education to tens of thousands of children. He provided homes for over 10,000 orphan children, and all that before he began his 17-year ministry as a missionary. Verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Mercy is the empathy of Christ. George Muller saw how bad it was to be a child without parents, and he welcomed such children. Christ saw how bad it was for us to go to a lost eternity. He saw so clearly and so deeply that he was prepared to do something abhorrent to himself as Lord of life. He was prepared to die. And purity of heart means right motives and no secrets. A form of accountability where what we are in public is what we are in private and vice versa. And George Muller got that. He handled the equivalent of today of over a hundred million pounds worth of donations. But he was scrupulous in his accounting, declaring publicly every penny received. And this open, transparent purity is what we see in Christ. There is no secret code to Christianity. Christ lived his life in the open. He left us free to evaluate his words and his actions. He accumulated no personal wealth. His disciples saw everything he saw and did and told to the world. And we will only know true freedom in Christ when we live lives privately as we wish others to regard them publicly. That's purity of heart. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I've come to the sad conclusion that wherever there are human beings, there is conflict. It was quite an eye-opener for me to stumble across a demonstration in London a year or so back and see people uh, shouting. At one point, the section leader, a little portable loudspeaker, shouted, what do we do when? I can't remember what he was challenging the crowd with, but I can remember their shout. They shouted, we fight back, we fight back. Uh, and the social media can take the impulse of a moment, can't it, and cause damage for years. What does it mean to be a peacemaker in a divided world? Well, the harder it gets, the more important it becomes. The last beatitude is the longest, verses 10 onwards. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This one repeats itself. Verse 10 says, basically, blessed are you when you're persecuted for your faith. And then verse 11 basically says, blessed are you when you're persecuted for your faith, again. And verse 12 links that persecution to great, re great reward. It is clearly important to God. We are called to love our world which will reject us. If we stand for Christ, the church should not be looking for ways of blending its values with modern society, but ways of standing out distinctively in love and truth. 
in the knowledge that this will bring trouble. We should be shouting out the good news. We have nothing to hide or fear. And that's why images like salt, uh, lasting purity are used here, and light, shining for others, are used. Now is not the time for God's people to run and hide. If the churches are closed or semi-closed, we go online. If the churches are opened or, or semi-opened, we go back into church and we stay online. We are in the middle of the biggest revolution in the communication of the gospel in the history of humanity. It is a good time to be alive and following Christ, even though we are in the middle of a global uh, pandemic. And even though we are in the middle of a global pandemic and in the middle of a global spiritual phenomenon, it's all about the individual. The kingdom of God grows one by one. So what do you feel personally about these Beatitudes? They represent the character and actions of Christ so directly to us, they are really quite intimidating. Do you feel that you've breached so many of them, there's no way back? When I was 14, I, I arrived at a covenant, that covenant in Cricketh for the second year in a row. It was a year before um, uh, that experience I had when I was 15. And the leader of the camp pulled me aside and sat me down. He said to me, you were so badly behaved last year that when your application came in, I nearly refused to let you come. But in the end, I decided to give you another chance. I'm glad he gave me another chance. Because if he had not, I would not have been sitting in that crew station a year later reading one of the Beatitudes for myself, the one about mercy. Don't be intimidated by the wonder and the grace, the power and the beauty of the Beatitudes. They are for you. Only the devil doesn't believe in second chances. God has seen what you have done or not done with the Beatitudes over the last week, month or year. And he has decided to give you a second chance. Receive his compassion. Reveal his compassion. If you live the Beatitudes, you will be blessed. In fact, if you live the Beatitudes, I think you'll go far. You'll be filled. You'll be approved. You'll be rewarded. And although it doesn't know it, this world has never needed you and the Christ you serve more than it does today. Pick one of these Beatitudes and do it. Because today, this is your second chance. Loving Lord, thank you. Thank you for the character of Christ revealed so powerfully through these verses. Help us not to abandon them because we have breached them, but to recognize that in teaching them, your Son, Jesus Christ, held out his hand of compassion to us and called us to reveal his compassion to the world. Realizing that the word blessed represents the incredible wonder of being filled, approved, and rewarded by you, help us in this moment to look at the world you have made with your eyes of compassion and to take this second chance in the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
in a moment we come to our final song in which there's an opportunity to take our offering. Please do support the work and witness of our church family to this parish and to all our mission partners further afield. And thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world and do stay online and send greetings to one another for a few moments. And now a blessing before we have our final song. May Jesus Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen.